So we're going to discuss what's wrong with healthcare today and my approach to changing it and trying to revolutionize what I call healthcare. So when we look at healthcare, we're all very familiar with the modern medical model. And it came out of really battlefield. It came out of a triage concept at the end of the Civil War. Through Civil War, World War I, World War II, you needed care to deal with catastrophic injuries. And prior to that, it was herbs and plants and all these hands-on type therapies. And those worked really well for certain things. It worked really well for small injuries. It worked really well for chronic conditions and things of that nature. But it didn't do well with catastrophic wounds. And that's really where our modern medicine came from from. So Verkow was the father of modern medicine. He kind of came up with this idea that we had to have a triage type care that could handle large gunshot wounds, large infections, large traumas. So if you were in the Civil War and you got hit with a 50 caliber ball in the arm, it would shatter the bone. Well, you're being held down on a table by five guys while they're cutting that arm off. It was catastrophic. And so what ended up happening is they had to find other ways. A little company out of Maryland, invented something called laudanum in 1863. Laudanum was the precursor to morphine. So they created this. So it's right in the heart of the Civil War. You had horrific injuries and disease and all kinds of things going on killing soldiers. This little company comes out and says, look, we got something that you can give these guys. They won't die a shock on your table. So they started introducing laudanum to them. The Rockefellers then discovered oil in Pennsylvania in the 1870s after this. Now, when they manufactured the oil down to kerosene and things like that, you only use about the top inch or two of a barrel of oil. The rest of it was just a leftover sludge. So they started investigating, what can we do with this sludge? They hired chemists to come in and start looking at it. They really, truly invented the field of biochemistry. So they started investigating and then looking at it, and they realized that this leftover material was carbon-based. This carbon-based material is the same as the human body. So now you have this carbon-based material, and they well, well, there's something we can do with it. We're carbon-based. Let's start playing with it. From their work and their research in the 1870s came your Tylenols, came your Bayer Aspirin Company. All of this came out of this, and they started learning that we could invent something that we now know as a pharmaceutical. So they started getting into this, and you look at it, and you think, okay, pharmaceuticals, what are they doing with this? They saw the future. They went out and they saw the future and they saw, my gosh, this is going to revolutionize what we knew at the time of medicine and healthcare. So they decided that we have to get the whole world to play ball. And at that time, the Senate seats were bought. $25,000, you could pay for your Senate seat. So the Rockefellers and all their little friends, they had seats. They were the ones behind this. So they decided, all right, let's go to the Senate and tell them what we want. And then we're going to put this through. The Senate declined it. We're getting into the Teddy Roosevelt time, the trust busting, all these things. They didn't want monopolies. And they said, you'll have a monopoly on health care. We can't allow this. So in 1895, they propositioned the Senate. They did it again in 96, 97, and 98. And they were declined all four times. Then they decided, well, we'll bypass the government. We'll go directly to the, the medical schools that were in the country at that time. There were about 26 or 7 of them. As they went to these schools and they started approaching them, they said, hey, here's this new thing we're going to do. We're going to take over the healthcare field. This is going to be the future. 20 of them said, no, you'll have a monopoly. Six or seven of them said, okay, this is great, because they were the schools that a lot of these guys originally came through. It was your Harvard. It was your John Hopkins. It was the old boy collection schools. So this group that didn't play ball now became the enemy. So they hired a gentleman to go through and figure out what are we going to do to get this change to occur. He said after years of research and about $600 million that was invested at the time, they discovered that he told them you have to get the housewife out of medicine. She's killing you. It's the housewife that's delivering the baby. She's taking care of the colds and the flus. You want your new therapies to do this. So you got to get her out. Change everything over to Latin and Greek. So they started switching the language. You have to now require a degree to get into medical school. Because prior to this, you just went to medical school. Now you're going to have a college degree. That got rid of all your minorities and your women. So they created a class is what they actually did. And through a lot of money, they bankrupt the other 20 medical schools. So then the groups that played ball with them spawned all the medical schools we currently have today. So when we look at this, we think, gosh, this is where our entire healthcare field has come from. The problem with this is, and in creating this field, they abandoned what worked for certain things 
in a quest to become the dominant player on the block. So homeopathy, chiropractic care, osteopathic care, anything natural got pushed aside and they were driven to the forefront. And now they're it. They're the only thing that remains any longer. And so they decided, okay, we got a, we got a monopoly on this. We got this new drug industry. There's money to be made here. And they have made billions upon billions, if not trillions of dollars on this. Now, is it all bad? No, it's not. It's very good at what it was intended for. It was intended for acute traumatic injuries and infectious disease. The problem comes is what if you don't have an acute trauma? What if you don't have an infection? Maybe you have heart disease. Maybe you have cancer. Maybe you have lupus or Crohn's or some autoimmune type disorder. None of those are acute, traumatic, or infectious. And so the World Health Organization has gone through and they looked at this and they rank us every year. You can go through every nation in the world and see who dies from what. And so they, they list it and they split it into two groups, chronic degenerative and acute traumatic. In 2016, which is the most recent data we have, 12% of our population died from acute traumatic conditions. 88% died from chronic degenerative. Now we look at that and say, well, who cares, right? What's the big deal with that? Well, your model is designed to handle the acute and the traumatic. So you have a lower death rate. But the 88% of the 3 million people that died, died from chronic degenerative things. If your entire medical system is set up to handle acute, then what does it do with the chronic? And that's where we're here today. I've spent my entire career and my family before me spent their career trying to figure out how to help people on the chronic degenerative side. Now, one of the things I like to use is a shape sorter ball. You see it with little kids, two and three year old kids, where they're learning shapes. And this is really, it's pertinent because it explains what's wrong with our system. We have spent so much time moving away from a doctor that does everything to doctors that do only one thing. And there's nothing wrong with having specialists. It's a good thing for some conditions. But if you go to your doctor and you're having heart palpitations and the doctor's like, well, I don't do that. I'm going to send you over to the cardiologist. And the cardiologist says, well, that's not really a muscular problem. It's an electrocardio problem. You got to go to the electrocardiologist. Then you get over there. They run their EKGs and all their tests. They don't find anything. Well, it's probably hormonal. Let's push you off to the endocrinologist. When the endocrinologist is finished with you and they decide they can't find anything, it's got to be in your head. Time for your psychiatric visit. The problem with this compartmentalized care is that nobody's looking at the big picture any longer. And that's kind of where our ball comes from. We are a ball. We're complex. We're not just one shape or one thing. We're many. The problem with medicine is they own the circle. They own it. This is their shape. If you walk into their practice with any problem and it's a circle issue right here, it is a home run. They're going to drop that thing in there and you're going to have a phenomenal result with them. But what if you walk in with, say, a triangle? What if you walk in with a square or an oval or maybe that little star? They're going to take their circle, they're going to put it on that star, and they're going to try and pound it in. It doesn't work when you're three. It doesn't work when you're 50. It's not going to work. A little kid's not going to make it fit, neither's medicine. And the problem with this compartmentalized concept is that we're now ignoring the fact that there's other shapes. We're saying, look, we own the circle, therefore everything is a circle, but it's not. And we see this a lot in, in generalized healthcare. If you, I always tell patients this, when I walk in the room, they ask, doc, why do you do this? How are you doing this? What's different between you and all these other people? And I'll say, you know, it's a lot like an elephant in the room, right? We all know the story, the, the three blind guys touching the elephant, right? And one's got the trunk, one has an ear, and maybe one's got the tail. And they're describing it. They're telling you, oh my gosh, it's this. It's got to be this animal. I know it is. But they're so different, they can't tell. My profession walks in, we open the door, and we look at three blind guys going, why are you guys holding on to an elephant? Because we see the whole picture. We see the whole ball. We're not just buried in, it's got to be a circle. It's not compartmentalized. And that is why I truly believe we have such a high chronic death rate globally. This country, it's excessively high, but it's also globally because we're always looking at just that one piece. But what if you have another? 
So I've spent my entire career searching the globe, looking at different healthcare fields, different cultures, different groups, and how they dealt with things. You know, you have a colicky baby. How did some culture in India deal with colic? How did the American Indians deal with colic? How did the Irish deal with colic? They all had it. We've had colicky babies for a thousand years. How did they deal with it? And as you go around, you start seeing commonalities. And that's probably the one gift I guess I have in healthcare is I can take complex healthcare systems from around the globe and I can stitch them together. I can see the common thread that runs through them. And as I've been able to do that, I can borrow from one or another and blend them into what has really become my method of practice, what they call the McCaffrey method. It's that blending of multiple healthcare systems that specializes in chronic degenerative care. It's really truly helping someone get their life back. That's the whole goal of it. How do you help someone restore normal function? How do you help them reacquire what they've lost? We get caught up in this idea that, oh, we're getting older, therefore we're supposed to get slower. We're supposed to get more tired. We're not supposed to digest our food. We're supposed to get arthritis. It's not true. We should be able to lead a very active, healthy, physical life well into our late 80s. And if we can't do that, then something's wrong. You have to search for that cause. And we go back to the medical concept and they say, well, it's drugs, it's drugs. Nobody wakes up aspirin deficient. Nobody wakes up blood pressure medication deficient. Nobody wakes up diabetic med deficient. It doesn't happen. We acquire these conditions. Sometimes it's lifestyle. Sometimes it's your environment. Sometimes it's mechanical traumas. Maybe it's emotions or nutritional things. It's all these things. But if you don't look at all of them, then you miss the big picture. And that is why I truly believe we have such a high death rate in the chronic degenerative diseases. So what are they? Cancer, stroke, heart attack, diabetes, Alzheimer's. Those are all chronic. They're all degenerative. None of those are acute and traumatic. Anxiety, depression, it just goes on and on. Blood pressure. It's not even really a disease. It's just a symptom. Right, So you look at these things and you say, gosh, can we help the body to restore normal function? And if you can do that, you can turn somebody's life around.